Hey, everybody, can you hear me all right? Awesome. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us for this awesome event, uh, Hops in Water. Uh, my name is Chris Chappell. I am the Conservation and Brew Shed Program Manager over at Washington Wild. Um, and I am so, so, so excited to have you all here. I'm so excited to be partnering with Yakima Chief Hops or YCH to put on this awesome event. Um, we are going to be talking about the connection between clean water and awesome craft beer and healthy hops. Um, so I hope you all grab some beers and are um, ready to go. Um, so first I want to introduce, uh, we have a couple of my coworkers, Tom Uniak, our executive director, is on the call. We have Evan Lapine and Hillary Sanders, who is going to be uh, managing the, the chat down that way. There we go. Um, so feel free to uh, leave comments or uh, concerns. Um, uh, so Washington Wild is an environmental advocacy organization that helps protect the wildlands and waters in which we all enjoy um, both um, as humans um, and as beer drinkers. Um, and kind of just to start off the bat, I want to acknowledge that um, I'm currently working on Duwamish land and we have folks from all across Washington joining us tonight. If you know the name of the original people of the land you are on, please drop it in the chat right now. Um, we at Washington Wild want to recognize that our office is on Duwamish land and much of the work we do is on the territories of other coastal Salish tribes. We encourage all of you to learn more about the indigenous tribes that, we, that are the original stewards of this land and are still here and leading the efforts to safeguard land, water, and wildlife. Um, so um, a couple, uh, um, housekeeping items. So we're going to be doing some trivia throughout this event. Um, so the way that we're going to do that is we're going to, um, uh, you know, between some of the speakers, we're going to, um, or I'm going to ask a trivia question, and then the first person to put it in the chat is going to win a prize. And let me give you a little preview of some of the prizes that we have. Maybe. There we go. So our awesome partners, Yakma Chief Hops, have put together some cool prize packs that we will be throwing in some uh, Washington Wild goodies as well. Um, so we'll have three trivia questions and each person will win a different prize pack from YCH and Washington Wild. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. You know, once again, huge thanks to them for, um, for helping uh, put on this event and being super awesome partners in general. Um, so also we're gonna be doing a quick Q&A at the end. So if you wanna leave some questions um, in the chat, um, we will get to them at the end. Um, and so we're gonna start off by watching just a short video about um, Washington Wild's work across the state of Washington. No. On September evening in 1979, a handful of conservation activists met at the College Inn in Seattle's University District. Hours later, a new organization was born, Washington Wilderness Coalition. So I've lived in Washington State for 30 years, and it is a diverse state in that it has the Pacific Ocean, mountains, rainforests, deserts, lakes, rivers. Washington Wild is a local organization that protects all of that for all of us. And that is why I'm a proud volunteer for the Washington Wild organization. Today known as Washington Wild, over the past 40 years, the organization has led efforts to protect nearly 3 million acres of designated wilderness throughout Washington state. I'm Yvonne Krauss, I'm the executive director of the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance. 
we as mountain bikers have been working with Washington Wild on a very unique challenge of wanting to support wilderness and supporting that in Washington State and at the same time losing access when we do so. Um, so it's a unique challenge for us as mountain bikers. It's a very rare partnership with Washington Wild. We've been able to make that happen together, looking at wilderness boundaries, looking at trail alignments, looking at what gives us the best access for both mountain bikers and resource protection. It's very unique. It's been a very treasured partnership and I look forward to that partnership for 40 more years. Washington Wild brings people together in the vigorous defense of our remaining ancient forests. Free-flowing rivers, wildlife habitat, and clean air and water. My name is Brian Cladis, me chairman of the Swinomish tribe, and when Swinomish partnered with Washington Wild, we knew it was going to be a good fit to oppose this mining in the headwaters of the Skagit River, which is the only one in the lower 48 that still has every species of wild salmon still spawning in its tributaries. And in seven generations, our kids need to be standing here telling the same story to those that need to know. While much has changed over the past 40 years, our national parks, forests, and other public lands are under increasing threats from unregulated mining, new dam construction, and other development. You must have good quality water to make good quality beer. Being a craft brewer and a fairly, fairly small craft brewer compared to the big breweries, we're reliant on producing a quality, consistent product. So locally, we, we try and do a lot to keep our river clean and pure. And working with Washington Wild, it just helps to expand that throughout the state to, to keep our natural resources pure. And, and as a brewery, it's just so important. Key to their success is building powerful grassroots networks and winning coalitions around protecting our public lands and wild places. The mission of Washington Wild to make sure that we preserve low uh, areas where families can have access and for salmon spawning is really critical over the coming 50 years because that's the kind of wilderness that we will be able to use for generations to come. Washington Wild does a great job that's very unique. It brings together communities, different partnerships to be able to establish the road to get wilderness through Congress. It's not easy to pass legislation. You have to bring people in a community together, different organizations, bring together a whole coalition of people to get the kind of energy to get legislation through Congress. That's what Washington Wild does uniquely and very well. Join me in supporting Washington Wild's leadership in protecting and defending our local wild lands and waters today and for the next 40 years. I hope you all enjoyed that uh, quick little video. Um, so now I kind of want to talk about, you know, the Brew Shed Alliance and why Washington Wild is working with, you know, the craft beer industry. Um, so the Brew Shed Alliance is a program underneath Washington Wild that has brought together over 60 breweries, pubs, hop, gr hop growers, maltsters, um, and other craft beer related businesses around this, you know, the core idea that clean water means good beer. So um, these, you know, organizations or businesses really support Washington Wild's work um, and have been for a number of years through a lot of different ways. You know, under normal circumstances, we'd be doing a lot of, um, you know, pub charity events, tap takeovers, you know, those kinds of in-person educational fundraising events. Um, we've also done a number of um, charity beers, one of which is with our good friends over at Bail Breaker, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. But another thing that these breweries do is they, they really lead, uh, lend a small business voice to, you know, a lot of the conservation issues we're working on. So we'll do a joint letters, you know, um, in support or in opposition of different activities around the state, um, 
in support of conservation. So say there's, you know, a proposed dam on the Skagit headwaters, and we want to put together a letter to oppose that. You know, we'll reach out to um, businesses, conservation groups, um, recreation groups, um, and elected officials to sign on to this letter. So we kind of have a strong voice as one um, to oppose um, something like a, a, you know, a mine. Um, in breweries and beer industry, businesses really bring a strong perspective because they are a small business and a lot of these, you know, government agencies and elected officials that receive these letters, you know, really care about what their small businesses in their constituencies, you know, care about. Um, and since craft beer is a really strong part of Washington, a lot of these, you know, breweries and pubs are really community centers where people congregate and they trust their local breweries or local pubs or local restaurants. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's the tie that, you know, water is 95% beer and clean water equals great beer. But another, um, another way that people really don't think about and which is kind of bringing us here today is that, you know, the agriculture side of beer that really depends on water. So, you know, Washington has really great, you know, beer agriculture, obviously YCH and all of their awesome hop growers are depend on water and also the barley growers that are then, you know, malted and um, used for beer. Um, you know, so my, my theory is the reason why we have such incredible beer here in Washington is because we've got the availability of awesome clean water and these fantastic local, um, you know, ingredients that we can use. So I want to pull up an image real fast to show you. Sorry, my computer's got too many things going on at once. There we go. So this is kind of what we call the brew shed connection. So, you know, clean water takes a long journey before it gets to your glass. So it starts in the peaks and ends in the pint. And along the way, there's a lot of threats that can happen to them, um, you know, whether it be um, pollutants, you know, proposed mines, um, things of that sort. So Washington Wild really works to make sure that this, the water is clean and safe the whole journey down, down the mountain um, by trying to get, you know, wild and scenic designations in or opposing, like I said, mines or other pollutants in the water so we can have really great beer. Um, so, now I want to throw it over to, we want to hear from our, our hop growers, right? So I'm going to throw it over to Levi. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the introduction. I'm going to just kind of, I'm combating two screens here. Um, it seems like my laptop is kind of on its last leg, so I'm going to be running off both the uh, the phone and the laptop. What's a Zoom session without a little technical difficulties, right? So, um, hopefully, we uh, can get through this without anything crashing on me. But uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Just initially, just want to say uh, a big big thank you to Washington Wild for having us out here today. Um, we're especially excited to to like garner that relationship we just started. Um, especially around like environmental stewardship, specifically water management. I, it would be selling ourselves short if we said that water wasn't um, important for us here in the hop growing region of the world, or at least the US. Um, but we recognize that intrinsic uh, relationship between healthy hops and, and um, healthy watersheds. So uh, we're really happy to join the conversation today. Um, I myself am going to be passing on the torch to um, a man who knows a lot about the hop industry. Um, in fact, he's probably one of the most knowledgeable people out there in the world uh, when it comes to hops. But um, he's also our chief supply chain officer and um, resident baseball enthusiast. So I'm gonna pass the torch off to Steve. I'm gonna navigate through some slides here. Um, but Steve, if you'd like to talk about YCH and, and, and who we are. Sure, thanks Levi, I appreciate it. And thanks to Washington Wild for hosting this. This is always uh, an educational experience for us to uh, learn more about what we can do to uh, preserve our watersheds and make the water cleaner and, and more plentiful for, for irrigation and for fish and all the other 
uh, ecosystem that depend upon good, clean, plentiful water. So thanks for the work you do. Um, I think Levi, do you have a few slides there for me? Yeah, I'm trying to get uh, the slides okay. up there. I think I need some permission access. Okay, I I can give you permission to do things at work. I'm not <laughs> sure I can do the uh, the IT <laughs> part here, but uh, while you're doing that, I'll just tell you a little bit about our company. We're a 100% grower owned company. Uh, we're headquartered in Yakima, but we've got grower owners. Uh, down in the Willamette Valley as well, farming in that watershed. And then we've also got a group of growers that we work with down in Idaho, down in the Treasure Valley. So uh, let's see here if I can. Oh, there we are. Yeah, so uh, our mission as a grower owned company is really to make those connections between family hop farmers and uh, the world's finest brewers. Uh, and uh, that kind of drives our daily work. Uh, we really have a strong compassion and, and passion for uh, the planet, leaving the planet in a better place, uh, being owned by multi-generational farm families. Uh, that's kind of natural for us to uh, be focused on that. Um, we uh, also have a passion for the people all up and down the supply chain from the farms all the way to the breweries, making sure that uh, we treat them correctly, and uh, that includes the farm workers, to the production workers, to the logistic folks getting uh, our hops to breweries across the planet. And then also we have just a strong commitment to uh, our communities. Uh, we've got uh, our main office in Yakima. We've also got a uh, office down in Sunnyside, the lower Yakima Valley, and then we have sales offices in, in Europe, in Hong Kong, China and salespeople literally all over the world. And uh, wherever we have a footprint, we want to work hard to make our communities uh, healthy places to live and to work. Um, our families have been growing hops here since 1869. My great-great-grandfather uh, planted hops up off of Otanum Creek, um, right across the uh, creek from uh, our Yakima Nation neighbors uh, back in 1869. Uh, we also have access to some wonderful hop varieties that are developed by our uh, uh, associated uh, group with Yakima Chief Ranches. Uh, our sustainability program, uh, we call our Green Chief program, was actually developed about 12 to 14 years ago, designed to get our growers together and collaborate on best practices for sustainable agriculture. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's interesting because I grew up on a hop farm and the way we handled water on the farm back then is completely different than the way we do now. Uh, we had basically real irrigation. Uh, we had a lot of runoff. Uh, we weren't doing our river any good uh, the way we were irrigating back then. And since then we've gone to 100% drip irrigation, which keeps the water in the field, keeps the nutrients in the field, and it's a much more efficient way to uh, uh, irrigate uh, so that we aren't putting so much pressure on our Yakima River for, for those uses. Um, because we're a grower-owned company, we try to get as much uh, proceeds back to the farms as we can so they can reinvest in sustainable practices in quality and uh, can also give back to their communities. And uh, bottom line for Yakima Chief Hops is we, we just try to be a good good neighbor and uh, 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 making positive changes uh, in our community. Um, yeah, I think from that, uh, what else do we have, Levi? I think that was, uh, I mean, very well said. Um, that's all I have for this segment. And all right. I'll probably bounce it back over to Chris. Yep, that's, that's a little bit about our company and you guys can take it from there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for that presentation. Um, it's really cool to hear that you're a multi-generation hop farmer. Um, great stuff. Um, so let's see, now we're going to throw it over to um, Kevin Quinn with uh, Bale Breaker Brewing Company. Guys. 
uh, yeah, first off, thanks thanks for having us. Uh, Steve, nice, nice job on that. Uh, Bill Breaker is a, um, is a, is a company. We're the only, we're the only brewery on a commercial hop farm. We're the only brewery that grows all of our own hops. Um, we, uh, our farm is also multi-generational. My, uh, uh, my in-laws have been growing hops here since 1932. Um, we coincidentally send all of our hops to Yakima Chief too, so we have a nice relationship with those guys. Um, but yeah, we um, we're also committed on on the farming side um, to sustainability and, and and better practices and um, protecting watersheds. Uh, we have we have obviously have a u unique view on it that you know we use water to to grow hops. Uh, we also grow barley now um as well so we have a we have a beer series uh called sown and grown that we grow all of the hops and and all of the barley so we grow 100 percent of the ingredients that that go into into that beer um and then we take the hops and the and the malt that we've grown and uh and the great clean moxie water hop capital of the world um and put it into beer um and so we're passionate about about keeping clean, uh, good watersheds. I mean, not only for the for the farming side, but the brewing side. And then we're also, you know, none of us live in the Pacific Northwest not to enjoy the outdoors. And so, you know, having those roadless areas and and protecting um, our rivers and stuff for access uh, for years and years is also something that us as a company and uh, Bale Breaker as a, as a brewery and then Loftus Ranches, our, our farm is, is very passionate about. So um, it's been a great partnership. And then um, last year we were approached by Washington Wild to kind of help drum up some attention um, to the Brew Shed Alliance. Um, they started doing, um, uh, working with breweries and they'd make small batches and sell, and, sure and sell pints of it um, in their tap room to, to raise money. And, and we came up with the idea of doing a brew shed IPA, um, canning it. And we, we partnered with uh, PCC in, in Seattle um, and sent it to all those stores. And um, Washington Wild was able to do tastings and stuff there and get in front of a lot of cons consumers and um, helped use that beer to um, raise a lot more awareness. And then we were also, uh, we also donated all the proceeds um, from that beer to Washington Wild. So um, yeah, we've, uh, I don't remember how many years we've been, we've been part of this now, but um, yeah, we're, we're very passionate about it. Um, you can't, you can't grow great agricultural products without clean water and you definitely can't make great beer without clean water. So um, yeah, we're, we're happy to be, be part of it and do whatever we can to, to help raise um, awareness and, and money for um, keeping our watersheds clean and safe. Sweet, thanks Kevin. Um, and thank you for your just ongoing support with Bill Breaker, y'all have been just fantastic. Um, so now we're going to do our first trivia question. So remember that the way we're going to do this is I'm going to say the question and the first person to get the correct answer in the chat will win an awesome prize pack from uh, Washington Wild and Yakima Chief Hops. Um, so the question, the, the first question is, what year was Washington Wild founded? Oh, Lynn Simmons got it very quickly. That is impressive. Um, Cool. Um, Lynn, if you want to shoot me an email, um, uh, chris at wild wild, I'll put it in the chat, um, dot org. Um, we'll get your contact info and send it out to you. Um, great. That was much quicker than I was expecting. So many people got the right answer so quickly. Um, so now we're going to, I'm going to shoot it back over to, uh, to Steve and we're going to do a little uh, hop grower panel. And I might help uh, just kind of get the ball rolling here. I'm going to throw some B-roll footage of just, for those of you that aren't familiar with just Yakima in general, um, just to get a good understanding of what's going on, like 
around harvest uh, preparation leading up to and uh, yeah it'll be hopefully silence <laughs> there we go but I mean if we want to kick it off I know Steve you'd mentioned that things have evolved quite a bit since um, you were on the farm, but even before that, like, if you guys want to talk to, I know we've got Joe Catron and um, Curtis Roy on the line as well, uh, both representing Yakima Chief Ranches. But if you guys want to touch base on like, kind of the evolution of, of, of water management on the farm and just how we see it today. Yeah, I can start off. It's a lot more sophisticated now than we used to be. And I think that's out of recognition that, uh, you know, at least here in the Yakima River Basin, uh, we share the water with a lot of different uh, groups and interest. Uh, obviously, there's some tribal interest, uh, and, and so we've worked hard the last few years to increase in-stream flows, and that comes a lot from irrigators just figuring out more efficient ways to uh, uh, use the water. Uh, I mentioned one earlier, you know, converting from real irrigation over to drip irrigation has been a big change. Um, most growers, rather than just taking a shovel out and diverting hops into a ditch like we used to, have these sophisticated drip systems that measure the water. Um, another thing that some of the districts here in the valley have done is convert their delivery systems from uh, water boxes and open ditches and that type of thing over to enclosed systems with flow meters to reduce transpiration losses and also more efficiently deliver the hops or the water to where they need to be. And that in itself is conserved water and help to enhance in-stream flows for, uh, uh, for fish and recreation and those types of things. Um, I think for a lot of us in the Yakima River Basin, our ultimate goal is to be able to uh, increase you know, in-stream flows and, and restore some of the uh, salmon runs. The Yakima River uh, used to be a, a major spawning area for salmon and it, it's uh, just a fraction of the fish that used to spawn in the, in the Yakima and the tributaries. And, and so I think that's a long-term goal of everybody uh, that, that we want to do to enhance it. Um, so uh, water quality is another thing. Um, you know, back when I was a young guy, uh, there were so many nutrients that were being run back into the river off of the fields because of the runoff from real irrigation. And now using drip, uh, those nutrients stay in the fields where they do the most good and, and the water goes to, uh, to, to the plant instead of uh, uh, being wasted. So a lot of things have changed and a lot of things need to continue to change for us to be good stewards of the water here in the Yakima Basin. Yeah, I mean, living in a desert, we're kind of reliant on that snowpack level, right? So this this week in particular, we've been feeling the heat. I don't know about you guys over on the west side of the state, but uh, I think temps tomorrow are going to be turning up towards 107 degrees is what I heard last. Um, but as kind of Kevin alluded to earlier, we're living in this state for not only just the location um, close to Haas, but we're we're outdoor enthusiasts as well. So being an avid um, skier, I enjoy going up to White Pass year after year. Um, this one goes out to the group. How do you see, like, how important is this water as a resource in the hop industry, um, maybe in the brewing industry as well, but also um, how have you seen those practices, like, evolved when water scarcity becomes an issue year after year if, if uh, climatic conditions present that challenge? Yeah, I see that Joe can't get unmuted, so I'll step in, and then I'll turn it over to him. I, I think, you know, one of the things, probably our last drought year where we didn't have enough water in the system to uh, uh, really uh, be able to take care of all the districts, the junior districts and senior districts, um, we, uh, uh, you know, a lot of growers get cut back uh, on, on their delivery, and, and that causes uh, yield issues and quality issues and everything else. So. It's, it's vital for us, uh, we, uh, our water is fed here in the Yakima Basin by reservoirs that are up in the mountains that store that snowpack. 
we, we would not be able to uh, survive on just the water and the river. So it's important for us to catch that water and to regulate it into the river at, at time that's needed, not only for irrigation, but for in-stream flows for fish and uh, uh, those types of things. So uh, I'll turn it over to, to, uh, to Joe and let him talk. I know he spends a lot of time with our growers and uh, hopefully we can get him unmuted and in here so I'm not doing all the talking. Yeah, no, I can, uh, I think I'm unmuted now here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks Steve. I, I, I agree with you. Just a piggyback on kind of what you were saying and uh, going back to being a multi-generational uh, family-owned uh, cooperative that uh, you know it, it truly is uh, a bunch of family family-owned businesses that uh, have come together to uh, form this supply chain that uh, you know it seems so um, important and uh, kind of indispensable at this point but the Yakima Chief supply chain is, is a fairly rel uh, relatively new um, group of growers that got together to really be uh, uh, looking towards the future and, and being innovative and, and, and doing things better and, and continuing to improve. And that's it's, it's such a mantra in, at both Yakima Chief Ranches and Yakima Chief Hops. Um, I guess I'll just speak a little bit on the, on the, on the brooding side, you know, as far as water, water management, um, you know, we're, we're breeding, we're developing new varieties of hops um, every year. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't come down to just uh, smelling exceptional and, and uh, looking nice on the, on the vine and, and, and be getting picked in the right window. But, but really, a, a lot of those uh, more beneficial attributes of newer varieties, uh, disease resistance, uh, you know, being able to almost be uh, a, kind of closer to drought tolerant than, than most of the commercial varieties that are out there right now. Uh, all those all those things are factored into breeding uh, new varieties and bringing those to market. So uh, from from the grower side, you know we we understand the the realities of uh, where our water comes from and how it can be variable year to year. And we are very active in doing what we can on on the agronomic side to uh, contribute to uh, sustainability in our in our industries. Yeah, I think that was that was very well said as well, Joe. Uh, sorry, that was the dog. Um, but yeah, as we see like things evolve over the years, do we see like an uh, the the future? Like, the, what does farming look like in the next twenty five years? I know technology has been utilized heavily um, these days, but I mean, we've got moisture meters here and there. Um, do you guys see trends occurring now that? could lead to new innovation in, in growing? Yeah, I think one of the things, uh, you know, for those of you that don't live in a irrigated river basin, um, delivery is so important. And, and some of the junior districts who have junior water rights, and uh, just to give you an idea here in the Yakima Basin, we just, I think two years ago, maybe three years ago, completed a 40 year process of Yakima River water adjudication, if you can believe it takes that long. And uh, in doing that, uh, you know, confirmed that uh, some of the districts have junior rights. In other words, they get their water shut off first in a drought year. And, and, and uh, some who have the senior rights uh, don't have to do any prorating. And so, the junior systems uh, in general have been uh, investing a lot of money in just uh, more efficient delivery and, and uh, uh, reducing evapotranspiration losses and uh, just leakage in pipes, that type of thing. And some of the larger districts, uh, because they have that guaranteed supply because of their senior water right, uh, I, I see great opportunity in, in investing in those districts and having the same type of efficient delivery systems because that just creates more water to be left in the river for, for other uses and needs uh, such as in stream flows. So I think that's probably the low hanging fruit there. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think there's been a lot of positive changes and, and there's still a little bit of work to do in terms of uh, uh, utilizing that valuable resource in a more effective way. 
And Joe, I know you've been bounced around from state to state, that being like Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, um, you know, given the current timing right now, like how's everything looking? And like, um, I know it's been hot. Has, has water been an issue this year? You know, so far, I, we're just, uh, I mean, we're right in the middle of our, of a hot stretch here, right? So we're, this is the first kind of prolonged triple digit stretch that we've had in the Yakima Valley. I know they're having the same in the Treasure Valley of Idaho this week. Um, but, you know, lead, leading up to this, it, it's actually been kind of a wet, mild uh, spring. And we're finally kind of getting into seasonal being normal temperatures. Um, and so water for us is, specifically in the Yakima Valley, uh, we haven't really been drawing too much on it. It hasn't been a real strain on the system. Um, and then, you know, our friends in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, it, they're actually getting pretty hot this week as well. Um, but it's it just such a, a naturally, it's a different climate down there. Much more maritime, a lot more rain, um, just cons more consistent moisture than, than the Yakima, uh, the Washington and Idaho regions. Um, so for, I mean, really, if, if you look at, look at regions, um, Idaho and Washington are, I mean, yield-wise, maybe a little bit behind a normal year. Uh, the, I think the wet spring um, kind of following burn back, um, we're typically, we're used to the temperatures warming up and following burn back, those plants really rebound and take off. Um, during that period this year, it was just a little cool and, 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 and wet, wetter than normal. And so plants are a little bit behind uh, yield-wise. I think quality-wise, um, you know, it's yet to be seen. We still have, uh, you know, four to five weeks, depending, maybe longer than that for certain varieties. But so we still have a, some time before those hops uh, come off. So um, we're, we're optimistic thus far. Um, there have been some like mildew pressures from that early, early moisture. And now that we're getting in the heat, we'll start kind of fading, phasing from uh, mildew pressures into probably mites and more, more insect pressure um, as the heat comes on. But that being said, um, water-wise, we're looking good this year. Um, and Yakima really is the one we kind of worry about the most. Oregon stays pretty moist. And Idaho has a spectacular system of reservoirs that um, they, they are, are uh, very unlikely to have water stresses, at least uh, as um, in, our, in our current environment. So um, things are looking good overall. That is, that is great to hear. I'm sure our brewers on the line are stoked to hear that as well. Um, you had mentioned kind of pest pressures and, and the influence of um, abundance or not enough water. Uh, can you speak to more of that? Like for those people that might not be privy to the pest side of uh, managing a farm. For sure. I would, uh, if we still have Curtis on the line, I'd like to defer to him mostly because uh, my mouth's getting parched and I'm in between beers, <laughs> but also because uh, he could speak uh, better than that than I could. Yeah, no, absolutely. But that's, I wanted to go back to, so Steve had talked about it a little bit and, and just going back to that drought year. So that was 2015 that um, we had that big drought and talking about the junior water rights. So the Rosa irrigation, it actually shut down, I think for two weeks in the middle of the growing season. So, you know, back in the day when growers were doing furrow or real irrigation, I mean, that could have been a real, real game changer, a real deal breaker. And I mean, not to say it wasn't the case with drip, um, but uh, it, it definitely made guys reevaluate their irrigation situation. And uh, so with that and looking ahead, Levi, like you talked about the uh, Yakima Basin uh, integrated plan is uh, where you're getting all these different stakeholders together, whether that's you know, the local tribes or the local farmers or those, you know, interested on the, the fishing side, it's, it's just been awesome. And, you know, it's nationwide, it's getting quite a bit of coverage um, with that. So, you know, I'd say that's going to be a huge part moving forward about is con conservation for irrigation. Um, but getting back to pest pressures. So, you know, in the earlier season when it's cooler, um, that's when you really see pressures with mildew. So mildew is a, a fungus, a spore that can affect the, the hot plant as well as the yield of the hot plant. Um, so right now the hot plants are blooming. So those cones are going to start developing. And if there's mildew out in the field, you, those mildew spores can get in the cone and actually deform them and really affect your yield. So 
growers are paying attention to that. Um, but as we get warmer, those spores don't like that warmer weather. So the pressure um, subsides a little bit. Um, it doesn't go away entirely. That's something they're always fighting. They're always constantly checking for. But with the heat, we do see there's uh, usually there's a pretty strong correlation as things heat up, you see an increased pressure of mites. And so that's kind of been the, the MO right now is getting out there in the field and, and uh, looking, doing your, your leaf counts of how many mites are on each leaf. And if they're getting to a certain threshold, that's when you go out and um, apply a, a pesticide that helps knock those numbers down. Um, but that's where you're always doing a balance. You don't want to go out and, you know, spray a pesticide if you don't need to. A, it's not good for the environment. B, you know, you don't want to have to spend that money if you don't have to. And, and so you're always looking at the, the natural predators that can keep those mites in check. So it's, it's always a balance. And as long as, you know, the, the threshold of mites to predators is in balance, you don't need a spray and, and keeps everyone happy. Hey, Levi, if, if I might butt in right here a little bit, because I, I know there's another thing that might be of interest to the group that, that we do at Yakima Chief Hops, and it's it's easy, easy for us to do because we're a grower-owned company, but, you know, unless you can really uh, be able to measure things like your carbon footprint and your water footprint, it's it's hard to improve. And so two years ago, we embarked on a pilot program in which we uh, did a life cycle assessment uh, to kind of establish some numbers. And I know Levi, you were involved in that as well and are involved in ongoing efforts to expand that study beyond just that pilot group and uh, get a handle on, on really being able to reduce both our carbon footprint and our water footprint uh, so we can uh, free up both for, uh, for better uses. So that's another project that we're doing that uh, we'd be happy to share results with as, as we get them over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's a great ad. I mean, uh, working with a, a group of growers that are like invested in that kind of study. And I mean, they, they see those um, uh, results as a positive thing on the farm. It, it makes my job, our job, uh, in the industry much easier to work with people that are uh, on the same page. So yeah, for sure, we'll, we'll be sharing those once those uh, results become available. Um, and I think with that, guys, you know, we're maybe a minute shy, but I think we're right on the money here um, to maybe, it looks like we're, everybody can get up, go to the bathroom, or I'm going to pass it over to you, uh, Chris, maybe go grab a beer. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank all of you so much. That was Awesome. It was so great to hear. Um, I look forward to going back and revisiting those conversations later too. Um, so we're going to take a couple minutes to have a beer break. So if anyone needs a refill, um, feel free to use this time. Um, and then I'm kind of curious on uh, where everyone is joining from and what you are drinking. Uh, so if you want to drop that info in the chat, that'd be great. Um, I am not drinking anything because I'm on the clock right now, but I actually went to uh, Chuck's Hop Shop, who is an awesome brew shed uh, alliance partner and picked up some beers from all of our uh, participating breweries today. So I got some Field 41 from Bale Breaker, um, the Peacekeeper Hazy IPA from Single Hill, and then I am soaked to drink this uh, varietal citrus wheat ale in the sun at some point this weekend. Um, so, cool, got some single hill rocket ship, oh wow, we got a lot of stuff, Pullman, cool, Ruben Super Crush, great beer, and then, um, just because I think this is a fun visual, um, I'm going to show the, uh, we got a little map of um, our Brew Shed Alliance partners. So each of these, you know, we got the a list over here of uh, different breweries, tap rooms, malt houses, hop growers, um, all across the state of Washington. And we got a couple Portland ones um, as well. So yeah, and then if you if you go to our website, wawild.org, you can actually see a full list of Brew Shed Alliance partners. Um, you can find um, the one closest 
to you. And then, yeah, we'll just wait another minute here. Ooh, Lucky Envelopes Mango Passion Sour. That sounds super good right now, especially on one of these hot days. Flying Bike, Zest Appeal, love Flying Bike. Single host cerveza. I love a good Mexican lager on a hot day. I drank many Pacificos in college living in Phoenix, Arizona in the summer because it was the perfect uh, summertime refreshing beer. And I'm sure that single hill one is, is much, much better than the, the Pacifico. It goes down way too easy. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure. I, especially, especially when it's 100 degrees outside. Uh, <laughs> just any reprieve from this heat right now, I will take. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel that. That's why I'm excited about this wheat beer. I haven't had a, a good wheat in a while. Um, yeah, but all of these are going to be really great this weekend. Um, cool. We got everyone back now. Everyone got a new beer. We're ready to go. Um, so next up, we're going to um, hear from uh, Zach Turner over at Single Hill Brewing Company. Hey, can you see me or hear me? Yeah, we got you. There we go. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. I'm drinking an Adams. Um, I wasn't really sure what you guys wanted to hear about from us. Um, so Single Hills in Yakima, we're a relatively new brewery, about two years old, kind of like Bridal. And uh, I used to work at Yakima Chief. I did a lot of things there, um, worked with a lot of the guys on this call. So it's nice to see you all again. Hey, Joe. Hey, Steve. What's going on? Um, Steve, uh, you've obviously learned how to use Zoom. I don't think you're actually in a baseball stadium, but I know you'd like to be there. I was uh, in charge of IT at Yakima Chief for three weeks and learned how to do that. So Fantastic. Yeah, maybe you can help me out. I actually don't know how to do that because we don't do any Zoom meetings in my company. Yeah. I'll, I'll, be by, I'll be by the brewery now that they're open for outdoor uh, service, and I'll, I'll give you a quick lesson. Sounds good. Maybe I think we're looking at maybe a week or so. We, we, okay. we got a few things to do. Cool. But that's exciting. Um, yeah, I thought I would talk about talk about water because that's what we're doing um can you see this map yeah we were all talking about water and whatnot and uh i thought maybe we just talk about where we're at so yakima obviously surrounded by this giant uh expansive desert and it really feels like desert right now in yakima being 100 100 plus every day i drove to tri cities yesterday that's a barren drive um so Single Hill is located in Yakima, and I think we're really fortunate in our water situation because we essentially get first use water coming out of uh, the Natchez River up in Natchez. Uh, this map here is showing the, all the water storage in the basin. So this is our water system in Yakima, and we basically get our water, as you can see my cursor on here, from this little red dot. Uh, right around here, that's the Yakima water treatment plant for the city of Yakima. So all of the water for Yakima first single hill comes from the Tyson River and the Natchez River, basically flowing straight out of the mountains. You know, coming down from, um, from Rainier into the Natchez and then coming down from the Goat Rocks area into the Tyson. So we're fortunate that where we get our water pulled off from, it's relatively untouched by humans because there's not much going on up both of these watersheds. Um, so as a result, when we make beer in Yakima, our water, um, we rely on the city of Yakima to treat it and we don't really do anything additionally to it. We make sure we've cooked it for a little while to, cook, to try to, you basically, we use heat to remove all the chlorine, we're just letting it sit in tanks. And uh, 
that's all we do at the moment. That could change if we ever have higher demand, but that's working out fine. And actually, I used to work at a brewery in Colorado in Fort Collins, and uh, we had the exact same situation there where everything came down from the Poudre River, um, fresh out of the hills. And, you know, that brewery, when I left Odell, we were making 75,000 barrels a year probably, and there was still no water treatment in place. Um, because everything came fresh out of the mountains from the Poudre River. They had, they did minimal treatment, but it just came out of the Rockies in a really clean state. So it was really nice. So in Yakima, I think um, the, the, actually the threats to water in our valley, in our valley probably are more to do with agriculture than anything else. Um, we do have a really clean watershed coming down from the Cascades, it's a lot of snow melt. Um, this year we, we have a good snow year, decent snow year, and then we had a mild spring, so we're not draining our reservoirs. Um, but from the point where we start sipping water off of the rivers or the irrigation systems, um, it's pretty clean. And then kind of the further you head down the valley, that's where like the risks to the water supply probably come from. So uh, Bill Raker of Rydal could probably speak to that a little bit more about what they see coming down the watershed. Um, but where we take it off is pretty clean and we don't have to do very much. Or you can take it back. Cool. Thanks, Zach. Uh, super appreciate you coming on. Um, uh, I think we're going to do another trivia question now. So everyone get ready. Um, this one has to do uh, with hops. So I want to know if anyone knows when fresh hop season begins. Okay, I think we got Caitlin Singer uh, was the first on the... Uh, on that one. So Caitlin, uh, I believe you have my email. So if you just want to shoot me an email um, to remind me and we'll get you your, uh, your prize. So next we're gonna hear from Chad over at Varietal Beer. Chad, are you there? Hey, yeah, yeah, it's me. Uh, looks like I'm running low, but yeah, yeah. So uh, just, uh, yeah, that's really some cool stuff to see there from Zach. Uh, yeah, he is definitely right. Uh, as you get further down the watershed here, well, not here, <laughs> clearly not in Sunnyside, Washington, but uh, down in Sunnyside, uh, you know, specifically we at Bridal, um, or Chris the Brewer, we do full uh, reverse osmosis filtration. Uh, because the, the wells in the Sunnyside area have uh, kind of a random mixing and uh, inconsistency depending on where they uh, are around the city. And uh, especially we've got one I was talking with a, a guy that works for the water department. There's one well that's out where uh, there used to be like a CAFO, like a, a feedlot that um, was right off the freeway uh, that the city, you know, later bought the land and moved the uh, the feedlot out further from town, but that water is uh, stinky for sure. So we uh, strip it down to nothing and build back up by mineral per uh, beer style and, and for each recipe. And then also try to do a lot of uh, reusing the water uh, by making sure because we're using our, we have a closed loop as much as possible on uh, using the heat exchanger and keeping our water uses low as curiously also about Sunnyside, it does not have irrigation. Uh, it sold off its irrigation rights long ago, even though the Sunnyside uh, Canal is one of its defining uh, kind of points and a statue to the founder of the Rosa Canal stands proudly in its Centennial Square. Uh, we uh, irrigate with like a non-potable water stream, but uh, as a happy consequence of that situation, it seems that uh, water costs in Sunnyside uh, for our purposes are very low. So we get uh, a good price on our water, but we still want to conserve it as much as possible. And uh, so, yeah, that's where we look to be maintaining closed loops on uh, places and keeping our water use low, uh, just for all those uh, connected reasons. Um, we also uh, have uh, 
became aware of Washington Wild and the Brew Shed Alliance through a Beers Made by Walking uh, effort, which we uh, part uh, engaged in along with Bail Breaker, and then uh, I believe it was like Lowercase, and I can't remember the other Seattle brewery, unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, and we went and walked Franklin Falls, which I'd never been to. It was really, really exciting to hear more about uh, the wilderness. You know, we, I've been spending a lot of time in the wilderness during uh, this, uh, this time, uh, this summer, right? That's, that's, that's why I'm in the wilderness a lot. And it's, uh, it's really uh, important, you know, my wife has been family just out picking up garbage here at Ocean Shores because conserving our natural uh, resources and, and luckily in Washington, we have a lot of them. Uh, we're blessed to be out here in the farthest point of the United States where uh, there's a lot of uh, publicly controlled land. Uh, I was surprised we've been picking our way uh, on my vacation with my family up in my travel trailer along the Ludwig Peninsula. And I was surprised that, uh, you know, how far we have to get off the coast at times, but very pleased to see it because of uh, tribal control of lands and uh, which uh, most of them are closed right now. But, uh, and just all of the public trusts that are conserving this land versus like the Rayonier, uh, you know, uh, ownership and, and uh, that kind of management. It's, it's really exciting to see. But uh, yeah, uh, Chris had asked me, what, uh, have you done any foraging? And unfortunately in the Acma Valley, we are an irrigated desert and uh, there's not too much to forage. And uh, like our local prickly pear is an, in, is an endangered species. And the, uh, uh, I thought about uh, doing something with our local sagebrush, but I'm pretty certain uh, it's poisonous. So, um, it's, uh, it's definitely something is always in my mind of being born and raised and never living anywhere else except the Yakima Valley, that uh, maintaining our uh, safe stewardship of, of water and our resources is incredibly important for the continued survival and enjoyment of that land uh, as we currently have uh, made it so. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting. It's, uh, and I think Having this kind of uh, opportunities uh, to be able to get out into nature and have people uh, educate you about uh, everything around you is what builds that level of engagement and uh, excitement that will keep generations to come uh, wanting to preserve uh, the sanctity of their lands and water and air. So that's probably my time. I I'm at risk of just running at the mouse if, if not uh, kept back. but. So yeah, no, normally we just forage for hops in our general area. That's about, that's our prime uh, ability. Awesome, thanks Chad. It looks yeah. beautiful where you are right now. I'm very jealous. Yeah, it's really cold in my laptop, my cat. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's actually exciting times. Uh, uh, you're just getting one last uh, outing with the family before the uh, inferno of hop harvest and the uh, selection and production. So, because, uh, like Zach, uh, well, I actually, he, he, he did work at YCH. I do still work at YCH. Uh, I love working in the hop industry and owning a varietal is just a happy uh, side gig uh, to keep my nights and weekends busy. So, cheers. cheers. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Not a bad side gig at all, I would say. Um, yeah, not too bad. <laughs> So we're going to do our, our last trivia question um, real fast. Um, so uh, I um, want to know who benefits from clean water? I think Sean got that first. Yep. And everyone agreed, it is everyone. We all benefit from clean drinking water. We all benefit from healthy waterways um, and healthy watersheds. So Sean, if you would send me an email, chris at wildwild.org, um, we will get hooked up. So now before we close, I'm gonna throw it over to my colleague, Mr. Evan Lapine. Let me unmute you. All right. I'm there. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Evan. I'm our Director of Development here at Washington Wild. And um, first, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. These, uh, 
virtual events um, have actually become uh, pretty common for, for us now during this, this time that we're living in. Uh, but they're super fun, actually. Um, you know, we, we definitely love our in-person events, um, but doing these virtual events have actually allowed us to, to reach more people all across the state um, and do fun things like what we're doing tonight. Um, so thank you for joining us for, for Hops and Water. Um, and I'd also really like to thank, you know, um, all of our guests uh, that are here to help us raise awareness on the importance of clean water um, and everything uh, in our state that that impacts uh, and makes Washington the place that we love to call home. So our organization, Washington Wild, I think what makes us unique uh, compared to some of the other environmental organizations is our focus on building coalitions. So community partnerships mean everything to us. Uh, especially, you know, we're, we're a small organization. We actually only have six uh, full-time staff members. So our focus of building coalitions is extremely important. Um, community partnerships, um, like what we're doing tonight, uh, is another example of that. So when multiple stakeholders come together because of issues that affect us all, in this case, uh, clean water, the results can be very impactful. So at Washington Wild, we've shown that, you know, with our recent wins on the banning of motorized suction dredge, mi dredge mining, uh, which helps us improve our salmon population, keeps our ecosystems intact. Um, everything that we focus on is about, you know, maintaining, defending, and protecting what we have. Um, but our work isn't done. So we need to keep pushing forward on campaigns like that we're doing, defending the Skagit headwaters for mining threats, the roadless rules, and the Wild Olympics. So right now, um, we are actually running a targeted campaign um, where we are looking to raise $7,500, and that's going to allow us to do a number of things to, to keep expanding our work and our reach on these issues. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, mobilizing grassroots efforts, uh, Washington Wild helped coordinate a coalition of more than 160 organizations to pass the legislation on banning the harmful practice of motorized suction dredge mining. The funding that we will get from this targeted fundraiser um, will allow us to generate two to 400 individual comments supporting strong regulations during a comment period that could be coming as early as the end of this summer. Um, when we talk about reaching larger audiences, you know, Washington Wild is a leading coalition of more than 140 organizations to stop the mining and logging threats in the headwaters of the Skagit River. Um, you know, the funding that, that we will generate, you know, will help us build on that and, and increase our media stories coordinate six new editorials, letters to the editor, and opinion pieces, and keep pressure on both sides of the border to protect this area. Uh, when we talk about defending old growth forests, Washington Wild is a leading statewide efforts to oppose plans to weaken roadless area protections of old growth forests and intact watersheds uh, for new road construction and logging. So this funding allows us to continue to build our coalitions, host events like this highlighting the final proposal on eliminating 9 million acres of roadless areas, which is expected to happen this fall. And lastly, continuing to expand our Brew Shed Alliance. Um, you know, Chris did a great job of, at the beginning of this, talking about how much that means to us and, and what we've been able to accomplish since we started that. So, you know, right now we have over 60 craft brewers and industry partners supporting, um, you know, protecting the sources of clean water and upper watersheds for safe drinking, salmon habitat, better tasting beer. So this funding will allow us to add three to five new partners to Alliance and engage in 30 Brew Shed Alliance partners on joint uh, letters supporting the protection of our areas and clean water sources. So my colleague, uh, Hillary, um, has just added the donate link uh, to the side chat. So I encourage you to support our work today with a gift that's meaningful to you. Um, thanks to Yakima Chief Ops, uh, all gifts up to $1,500 will be matched. So Thank you guys for making that awesome uh, donation and, and kicking our fundraiser off. Um, as well as a little incentive to anybody that gives, um, our friends at Grail uh, have donated um, a, uh, a water purifier for anybody that donates. We'll, we'll throw your name in a hat um, and we'll pick out a winner. So Grail is a longtime supporter of Washington Wild and a member of 1% for the Planet. Uh, they specialize in water purifiers that are perfect for any outdoor activity. And again, so those who donate uh, during our three-week campaign um, will be entered to win uh, one of these awesome purifiers. Uh, and lastly, you know, we know that everybody, you know, jumped on this call this evening, um, first and foremost, because we all love great beer. 
Um, but hopefully, you know, you've learned a little bit more about that super important ingredient, which is fresh water, um, where it comes from and how much we rely on it uh, in multiple industries across the state. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been super fun. And uh, I will send it back to Chris to finish this up. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, so, you know, I just want to, you know, uh, end this by saying a huge thank you to YCH for co-hosting this event with us. Um, really could not have done it without all of you. Um, and, you know, thanks to Levi, Steve, Kevin, Joe, Curtis, Zach, Chad, and then my colleagues, Evan and Hillary, for all speaking. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Um, uh, and then, since this is the end of my day, I am going to crack a beer and do a little toast. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, we hope to be doing more of these virtual events sometime soon, I'm sure. Um, and then cheers to clean water for uh, great beer and healthy hops. Awesome. Um, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good night. <laughs>